<coughs> what size criteria does she meet? So she's got high temperature of over, she's got a temperature over 38. Okay. She's got the respiratory rate of over 20 okay. as well. Brilliant. Okay, and her blood. Is there and she's her pulse as well. Her pulse is over. Pulse is, how much is pulse? Is it? 819. 819. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Fine. Okay, so she's meeting the SERS criteria. Mm -hmm. um, is there any evidence of infection? In the blood, her white cell count's high. Yep. That's probably SERS, yep. Okay. Yeah, her white cell count's 17. Okay. Um, the CRP, that's high. Okay. 191. Okay, so you've got your. So you've got your investigations, okay. And clinically, is there anything as well? Um, just fever and shortness of breath. Okay, so you've got a bit of a history suggestive. And uh, on examination, she's yep. got left basal inspiratory freckles. Okay, cool. So we've got, we've got both clinical and. Um, did you have a chest x-ray lady, I think? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Left lingular lobe consolidation. Great, okay, so we've got... Mm. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, cool. So we've got some... We've got lots of evidence of infection here, okay? Yeah. So, okay. when you see this patient, what should your first steps be? What should you be doing right now? Sepsis 6. Sepsis 6, love it, okay. Mm. Someone talk me through the sepsis 6. Do you want to so you just go one by one? Go on, Oxygen? Oxygen, brilliant, okay. So, have <laughs> you just done this? No, I, I said I just miss out with six people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I've got a special question for you. <laughs> okay. Um, oxygen, brilliant. Um, okay. So you've got oxygen, okay, we'll just name them first and we'll go through them in a second. Fluid. Fluids, yeah. Antibiotics. Yep. Measure lactate. Okay. Plus something else, do you know, we take at the same time. Two things you take, blood twice. So you take, well, yeah. There's another thing you take, which I think yeah. one of you going to mention, but I mean, not that thing. Hemoglobin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so hemoglobin goes, and you take okay. HP and lactate. I think you're going to take another blood. Blood Yeah, okay. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Wavelength. Um, <laughs> Catheterize, yeah. Brilliant, okay, cool. So, well, you've got a fun question coming up. Um, <laughs> okay, so, the fact. Can you tell me? Can you tell me why this? What's the logic behind the sepsis six? Let's focus on the first guys up here. Okay, these two guys. Okay. In fact, no. Focus on one, two, and four. Okay. The HB, the O2, and the fluids. Okay. Can you Those tell? Yes. Yeah, so, so no, I, it's a bit of a mixture. O2 fluids and HB. Okay. Those okay. three. Okay. Um, if you put them all together, what are we actually? What's the point of looking at these things and optimizing these things? What we're we trying to do? So they're likely to be. Or they could be hypoxic. Yeah. So you're trying to increase their oxygenation. Yeah. Fluids, so that if they're in a state of surge, they're going to have very leaky capillaries. Mm -hmm. So they, they're going to be third space in their fluids. Yeah. So you'd want to increase the intravascular volume. Brilliant. And HB. Um, that's, that's fine. I think. That's, that's good. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, you're right. Um, the, the underlying principle to the whole thing is oxygen delivery. Okay, that's what underp underpins these three guys. Like you mentioned, sirs, you've got the leaky capillaries, you've got fluids all in the wrong place. Okay, but let's go back to an equation, which is the oxygen delivery equation. Okay. Okay. So over here, can someone just tell me if we're trying to measure the amount of oxygen getting to any one tissue? What kind of things are going to determine how much oxygen gets there? What kind of things? Like how much hemoglobin you've got. Right? Yeah, so that's definitely part of it. So the concentration of hemoglobin. Okay. What HCL3. else? HCL3. So HCL3. HCL3. Um, hydrochloric acid. No, bicarbonate. Oh, by HCL3. Oh, sorry, sorry HCL3. Sorry. Uh, HCL3. Um, yeah, H. Oh, bicarb. Um, go, go, go through it. Why, 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 by car? Why is that going to determine oxygen delivery? I was just thinking of the Hasselbeck. Hasselbeck equation. Um, okay, that will affect. Okay, so yeah, that's an acid base sort of thing. Um, I see what you mean. Do you mean the oxygen capacity, the, the curve, the oxygen mm -hmm. curve? Okay, right. Okay, yeah, you're right. That actually does have an impact. Okay, that's true. Um, but 
in most okay let's say the patient's got normal pH so within normal parameters but you're right in sepsis it might actually be low but um let's say for now it's normal okay but yeah you're right okay anything else PaO2 PaO2 yeah so now here's the thing right um what actually determines the ox oxygen carrying capacity the amount of oxygen in your blood is the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin and the amount of oxygen dissolved in the blood okay and it's of those two fractions so you've got the amount bound to hemoglobin and the amount which is dissolved. Which one do you think is most of your uh, oxygen carrying capacity? Which one's? Bound to yeah, by far it's 99%, more than 99%, this is less than 1%. Okay, so the one which, you're right, PaO2 is important, but the, if you had to pick a value which really determines um, uh, the oxygen carrying capacity in terms of oxygenation of the blood, yeah. the oxygen saturations, if you're measuring them accurately, you've got a reliable probe somewhere, that's just as good for the, for the purpose of sepsis and oxygen delivery, okay? So, in fact, there's a guy I spoke to, I don't know if you know Tim Nutbeam, he's, uh, he's, um, he's one of the a and &E he actually edits, edits the sepsis, sepsis 6, and I had a word with him about this, and um, he said that if you've got a patient where you've got a reliable stats probe, okay, with a 100% reliable trace, there's never an indication for an ABG on that patient, because the sats gives you all the information that you really need to determine the patient's oxygenation level, as long as you know that sats probe is accurately recording a good trace. But with regards to the rest of the um, parameters you get, the pH and all the rest of it, you can get that phenus blood gas is absolutely fine. So there's actually, according to him, basically no indication ever for an ABG. It's all about an accurate saturation probe. Of course, if you can't get an accurate sats probe, then you might need to do an ABG. But yeah, so it's, it's saturations which are the key, point, the key thing here, okay? So we've got the oxygen content of the blood, which is gonna be given by the hemoglobin uh, multiply the by the percentage which is saturated, okay, plus a tiny contribution from O2 dissolved in blood, and you can pretty much forget about that really, practically. Okay, so the HB and the percentage saturation. Okay, what else is going to determine the amount of blood that gets to the tissue? It's not just the oxygen content of the blood; it's the yeah, exactly. The, the blood delivery, exactly the cardiac output. So, um, and what determines cardiac output? Times stroke volume times heart rate. Cool. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, and can someone just talk me through a few things that determine stroke volume? EDV. Hmm? EDV. Yeah. Okay. Just talk with you on. Okay, so that's the that's the definition of stroke volume. Okay, um, so can you give me some parameters which modify, which control that? Um, so venous return. Venous return. Okay, how does venous return modify it? So the more venous return you get, yep. the more passive fin you get in the ventricles, yep. and that determines your EDV and diastolic volume. Okay. And then end systolic volume is the volume that's left in the ventricles Agreed. after ejection. Yep. Yeah. So, so the greater your venous return. So the greater your yeah. venous return, the greater the EDV. Yeah. And it's greater the stroke volume. So can you just, yeah, you're right. Can you just talk me through from greater the EDV, the greater the stroke volume? Just talk me through that a little bit. Um, you're right. You're right so far completely. Yeah. Anyone else? Or? Right. Okay. Do you remember the stalling mechanism, Frank Stalling law? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're basically causing more stretch, you're moving the heart to a more efficient part of the contractility curve basically and it <coughs> has more forceful contraction okay so so that's one of the factors pre well means return preload basically okay mm -hmm. so when we're talking about the stroke volume three things determine this one you've mentioned preload okay and in a septic patient this is the one which has gone down usually initially there's usually a, um, a reduced uh, circulated volume so preload's dropped so they're getting crappy uh, stroke volume so they're getting a crappy cardiac output which is screwing up their oxygen delivery okay Anything else that determines stroke volume? Hmm? Contractility. Contractility, brilliant. I'll put that here. So, what kind of things determine contractility? In, in heart failure, then they're not going to be. Okay. So, it's going to be negative in heart failure. Okay. Exactly. So, it's intrinsic heart muscle disease or something like that, or heart failure, yeah. Um, anything else? Iron trips. trips, yeah, they're going to be positive, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, and lots of other things, electrolytes and calcium, in particular things like this, they can really affect you. And pH, in fact, um, can affect your contractility. Okay, 
and one guy over here, preload, what's the other thing that goes to preload? The opposite. Afterload. Yeah. So what do I actually mean by afterload? What do we mean? Residual volume remaining within. Okay, it's, it's yeah, th th these guys are actually pressures. So it's, it's the pressure you basically pump against, do you see what I mean? Yeah? Mm. Um, so, for example, can you give me some scenarios where you have increased afterload? Say to the left ventricle. Sense. Exactly, does that make sense, yeah? Um, yeah, so basically, what is the ventricle pressure contracting against in order to eject blood? Okay, and it will, yeah, the, the greater the, uh, the afterload, the more volume will be left over. Yeah, okay. Um, fine, so in most patients in sepsis, your, your preload has gone down, and that's what you need to optimise with fluids. Can anyone tell me in heart failure patients what what's different? If I have a this can be a bit complicated, but a heart patient, a heart failure patient with sepsis, do you know what the main determinant of cardiac output is in heart failure? Do you think it's preload, afterload, or contract? Let's say this is fixed. Okay, it's whatever it is for their disease. So out of preload and afterload, which one do you think has the bigger impact on cardiac output in heart failure? Preload. In, in most patients without heart failure, without heart failure, it's preload. Because oh. what what happens is um. In most of us, if we basically give ourselves more fluids, um, we'll stretch the atrium, we'll stretch the ventricles more, and our frank styling mechanism works great, and uh, we'll just pump out more blood. Okay. In heart failure, they're working at an inefficient part of the curve. They're already a bit overstretched, essentially. And if you give them more fluids, it just makes them even more inefficient. Okay. So they can't really respond very well to their extra fluids. They don't really, they've lost that mechanism, pretty much, right? Um, so what generally determines the output more is the afterload. Okay, so one the, like if you think about the treatment of heart, acute heart failure, we're going off sepsis a bit, but if you think about the treatment of acute heart failure, it's all about reducing afterload. Okay, you're giving nitrates, um, you're giving a bit of morphine, which is a venodilator, as well as all the anti uh, anti pain effect. Um, CPAP, um, the way that actually works is by causing a relative kind of um, well, it, it reduces the afterload basically for the for the ventricle. So yeah, when you've got a patient, just just on the side, but these are the three things that determine stroke volume and. Heart failure is generally afterload dependent, and most non heart failure patients are generally preload dependent. Okay? Cool. So, if we go back, um, so oxygen delivery, we should probably put a little equal sign equals O2 content of blood multiplied by cardiac output. Okay? So, if we go back to our sepsis 6, okay, we can kind of see why those three things are so important, right? It's all about oxygen delivery. So, O2 makes sense. Fluids makes sense. You're trying to optimize stroke volume. Okay, maybe a bit cautious in heart failure patients where you might actually make it worse. Okay, um, HB makes sense. It's oxygen delivery. Okay, so now I want to know about this guy, lactate. What's the lactate all about? Why are you measuring lactate? Anaerobic. Anaerobic. Yeah. So it's a marker of anaerobic respiration, and you can see it's basically a marker that if our lactate's up, there's a problem here. It, well, it doesn't prove it, but um, it suggests that there may be a problem here. Does that make sense? Because you're forced into anaerobic respiration. It's complicated by the fact in sepsis you actually get um, a few things happening. You get uh, endothelial dysfunction as well, and you get um, the whole coagulation system goes out of control in sepsis. So you don't know what kind of syndromes you get in sepsis. DIC. DIC, yeah. So at the end of the line you get DIC, okay, which is, you know, generally. So do, yeah, do you know what's going on? It's, it's sort of mopping up all your um, coagulate like, yeah. factors as well. So yeah, it's basically on autopilot. Yeah. It's just forming clots with whatever it can find and just using using up the factors and forming clots. So you're in a paradoxical state, you're forming clots and you're at risk of bleeding because you're using up all your coag factors. So it's a bit of a disaster. Okay. Um, so you get all these clots forming everywhere and they form in the microcirculation and that's going to impair oxygen delivery, isn't it? So when you get into kind of severe sepsis, uh, situation. Even when you optimize oxygen delivery, lactate might still go, might still be quite high. Okay. So uh, although lactate is a uh, lactate is obviously a marker of anaerobic respiration, and if oxygen delivery is poor, lactate is going to be up. But it's also a marker of the severity of the sepsis because the more, even if you've optimized oxygen delivery, if you've got lots of endothelial dysfunction, lots of DIC, lots of weird cry problems going on, you're still going to have a raised lactate. Does that make sense? Okay. So it just means we've got problems. Okay. Cool. Um, and. If we just go back to these guys, I think they're fairly self-explanatory. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and oh, okay, they're self-explanatory, but how important are they? Um, so I don't know how much your mortality increases by for every. Seven percent. What are they? 
yeah. There's some, it's great, I love it. Yeah, so every hour's delay is seven, says 7.6 and some things, but yeah, something like that. So 7.6% 7, 7 um, increase in mortality for every hour delay in antibiotics and sepsis, okay? And catheterise, what's the point? Surely that's just introducing an infection source. Just measuring urine output. Exactly, measuring urine output. And you guys already know the target urine, I know you guys know. Okay, fine. Um, we spoke about fluids yesterday, so that's fine. Okay, if we go back to our, we're on a complete side diversion there, but if we go back to our patient over here, uh, they met the SERS criteria, we decided they were septic. How do we decide if it's severe sepsis, by the way? Evidence of end organ damage, which is the reduced blood pressure. Yeah, Ooh, okay. Go back to the reduced blood pressure, okay? Yeah. <laughs> or sort of um, kidney dysfunction. Kidney dysfunction, yeah. Okay. Do you remember our Pac-Man is end organ perfusion? It's, it's basically that again, right? Um, so yeah, you've got poor urine output, okay? Um, any others? Serum lactate. Serum lactate, brilliant. Okay, serum lactate. Anything else? Confusion. Confusion, yeah. And then, it's just, it's just you. I was not expecting all from him. Um, yeah, that's basically that's the main three actually. They've been the um, sepsis clients things. So yeah, those three guys. Um, fine. So you've got endocrine dysfunction, and that's severe sepsis. Okay. What about septic shock? What's that? Well, that's low blood pressure. That's low blood pressure. Yeah. So it's defined as a slight blood pressure of less than ninety despite adequate fluid resuscitation, okay. Uh, is there more than one organ involved as well? Um, so you can get multi-organ uh, failure if you have more than one organ. Um, Would that be, is that does it cause septic shock? Um, I don't know if that, I don't, I don't, I don't think it is, but um, I can appreciate that if there was more than one organ affected, it would probably have a mortality similar to septic shock. Do you know the mortality of severe sepsis and septic shock? So severe sepsis, go on, make a guess. Of all the people with severe sepsis, how many will die? Oh, it's not that bad. But uh, depends where you are, I guess. Missed that. Um, <laughs> that's on camera, damn. Um, uh, <laughs> a bit later. I did that. Um, <laughs> no, I did that. <laughs> no, okay, um, it's 30%, yeah? Okay. Uh, for severe sepsis and septic shock. Septic shock is 50%. Okay, it's quite a lot when you think about it, right? Every patient with sepsis who's he doesn't basically doesn't respond well to your initial treatment that's a really bad sign okay cool